again everyone, I am Triggerman1976 and as you can see some things are the same, some things have changed, but above all I want to welcome you back to the blogcast. We're doing something different. We are um, playing with some, I've had some audio issues in the past and so we're trying a different setup to see if this cures some of those audio issues. On this episode we're going to be looking at a uh, clip from a recent episode of the podcast Within Reason hosted by Alex O'Connor, who's probably better known as Cosmic Skeptic, where he interviews Bart Ehrman over the infancy narratives, and Ehrman gets pressed on some claims about contradictions between Matthew and Luke. Now, in keeping with my policy of full transparency, I will say that the clips that we will see have been edited. I have edited out the ums and ahs of live communication. And as a result, if they sound more eloquent and intelligent, it's entirely my fault. First, I guess before we begin any discussion of whether or not something is a contradiction, we need to define what a contradiction is. And first of all, I give a shout out to uh, Dr. James White, who in his book, Scripture Alone, gives us such a positive definition. And he defines a contradiction as uh, anything that involves asserting that A is true and that non-A is true at the same time and in the same context. He goes on to add, it's not saying that A is true and that A can be seen in a different context. It's also not saying that A is true and non-A may be true by looking at the situation from another angle. So a contradiction is simply saying that A and not A, cannot be true in the same time, in the same sense, and in the same context. White goes on to explain, having two sources say the same thing in different words is not a contradiction. Having one author choose to include a different set of facts in his accounting of an incident than another author is not a contradiction. Having one author give more information than another author is not a contradiction. Having one author discuss a situation in another context, and hence having a different emphasis in his relating it than another, is not a contradiction. And this is important to remember because he also points out that most of the accusations of contradiction are the result of misinterpretation. People will say, well, you're just hand-waving, you don't understand the text, and I would say, that's the problem. We don't understand the text. So... Basically, we need to realize that most instances of contradiction simply come down to a failure to contextualize, usually in regard to content, literary genre, or historical circumstance. Next, there is a tendency to engage in anachronistic thinking, wherein we assume that our particular standards for historiography rather there are, and we tend to de-emphasize the standards of ancient historiography. It's often a misapplication of standards. Lastly, the failure to distinguish between an actual difference and a contradiction. And to his credit, Ehrman, when he discusses contradictions, usually makes these points. And he will also point out that where people sometimes will allege a contradiction, say, well, that's not a contradiction. What it is, is you know just one of those situations in the text. And we'll see some of this as we proceed, especially if you watch the video, he does this. So let's get into the video itself. In this clip, Alex is going to bring up a potential contradiction, and they discuss it. So let's roll that beautiful bean footage. Reading the birth narratives having this seeming seemingly quite bizarre detour to Egypt. You know, you've got the, the story's going on, then all of a sudden, oh, we've got to go up to Egypt for a bit. And then we're going to come back down again because, you know, Herod wants to kill all of the babies. And then you're thinking, what's well, a little bit strange that, that Matthew doesn't mention this as well. That, that and Luke then it doesn't. says, oh, that, that Luke, sorry, yeah. that Luke doesn't mention this. And then Matthew says, oh, and this is because yeah. Hosea says, yeah. out of Egypt I called my son. And you think, I don't want to be a cynic, but it sounds maybe a little bit contrived. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it is, <laughs> I think. Uh, and it's it's not just that it's not in Luke, but Luke's, Luke's chronology doesn't work if Matthew's chronology is right. So I think what we need to point out here 
is, first of all, Ehrman is setting out a false dilemma that we have to choose either between Matthew or Luke and without regard to the issue of genre. Now, there's a great deal of agreement in scholarship today that the Gospels fall into what is known as the the literary category of bioi. And bioi were essentially character studies that were bookended by, by telling us about this person's birth or their rise to public prominence. And then it also bookends that by talking about their either their death or their exit from public prominence for, for whatever reason. And Richard Burridge does a very good discussion of this in his book on the gospel genre. So the authors create this very bare chronology that is birth, public appearance, public decline, death. So you have these two points of reference. And then in between, they tend to fill in with uh, anecdotes and dialogues that were intended to give the reader insight into the character and substance of the person under consideration. And they will often pick and choose what information goes in there, and they will, they're will they free to do that. And it's not something that ever gets discussed. The, the, the Gospels aren't pure histories. They aren't pure biographies. They are intended to tell us something about the person of Jesus. And to that end, we can say that neither chronology is right, but they're both factual and they're they're both true if we allow the authors to speak for themselves. This is important because Alice goes on to mention that we do have two chronologies, and Ehrman goes on to lay them out. Ehrman, however, omits some key data, namely that Matthew's infancy narrative appears to take place over a number of years, indicated by the fact that Herod's decree to kill all the male children uh, targets those two years and younger, Matthew 2.16. Well, why is this? Because the wise men who approach the Holy Family give him such a window in Matthew 2.7. Luke's account, however, only focuses on a smaller time period of a few months, essentially from the time of the registration to the time of their purification. The issue, therefore, is whether or not Luke 2.39, which reads, And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their town of Nazareth, somehow overrules everything that Matthew says. And this is a point that Alex raises. Why is it that it can't be that the flight to Egypt happens in between these? At, that is, at what it, point? it seems strange that it doesn't, it doesn't get mentioned, but how? Why? why couldn't it be the case that Jesus undergoes the purification rites, then the flight to Egypt happens, then the move to Nazareth. You mean so that when, when it says, uh, so after they perform the purification rites, then they return to Nazareth, what it really means is, after they perform the purification rites, they went down to Egypt for some months, and then return to Nazareth. Yeah, that, that is exactly what I mean. Okay. Look, if you want, <laughs> you can reconcile anything. I mean, yeah. So, like, if you want to say it doesn't mean what it says, that's fine. It, what it really means is they went to Egypt. <laughs> now, what we need to notice here is that Ehrman doesn't actually respond to Alex's question. Instead, he gives something of a laughing dismissal. The point of Alex's question is whether or not logically or even grammatically the possibility could be excluded. I can say looking at Matthew's narrative that because he doesn't mention the purification rituals undertaken by the family, that there's a contradiction. But that would simply be ridiculous because that would mean I have to ignore certain assumptions, namely the Jewishness of the family. And it doesn't say in Matthew that the family stayed in Bethlehem after Jesus' birth, only that the wise men found the child there, Matthew 2.9. Well, why is this important? Because of something else. Luke says. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Could this have been when the wise men encountered the Holy Family on one of their trips to Jerusalem for Passover? It ultimately seems to depend on what one is willing to assume in light of the totality of the data. The simple fact is we aren't given enough data in either narrative to draw any conclusion about whether or not one contradicts the other. And this is something that Alex points out. So, so some people, why, some people why have said. Do people, that, why do people say that it says that? That why doesn't it mention Egypt in their opinion? The, 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 the well, uh, it, their their opinion is not that they know why it isn't mentioned. But I suppose what they're trying to do is avoid an argument from silence. Just because it doesn't say that this happened, doesn't mean that it doesn't. For, for example, you know, you know, well, what did I do this morning? Well, 
I got up and I had to respond to my emails for, for my job. You know, I had to go into work and I had to do some emails. And after I finished my emails, you know, I went and got lunch. And then somebody else says, oh, but I, I saw you at the post office. And he says, well, yeah, I mean, okay, so I went and got breakfast. And after I finished that, yeah, I had to pop to the post office. And then I went and used the toilet, uh, you know, and then I went and got a coffee. And, and, and then, I, then I went and got lunch. The fact that, you know, this information doesn't get mentioned might just be because it wasn't considered particularly important or might have been left out for any other kind of reason. We, we don't know. I mean, it does. Okay. Yeah, right. Alex's example is incredibly relevant to the discussion. We aren't privy to the reasons why one writer included a particular set of data and the other didn't. But he's correct in pointing out that silence isn't a contradiction, though Ehrman attempts to drill down on this point. I don't know how Luke could have said it any more clearly than he does. If you look <laughs> at it in the Greek, it's very quite clear. There are aorist tense here that that's Well, it's, just, it's not clear to me, so perhaps you can you can you could tell me as someone who speaks the language. Well, it's, what we need to notice here is that Ehrman is essentially trying to bully the point by bringing up the aorist tense of Luke's verbs, which only speaks to the extent of the action in question, namely that an action was completed in the past relative to the point in narration, which doesn't exactly deal with the issue of silence that Alex has brought up, though Ehrman does try to push back. And let me give you an analogy. I know people who think that Jesus, uh, as a young man, uh, went to India and and studied with Brahmins. Now, what if I wanted to say in Luke chapter uh, 2, verse 39, is that when it says that when they completed all the things according to the law, the law they returned to Nazareth, what it really means is they went to India, and that's and he stayed there for 10 years, and then from there he went to Nazareth. Uh, the people who are suggesting to you that Egypt is found in verse 39, what would be their argument against India being found in verse 39? Yes, believe it or not, there are people who believe that Jesus traveled to India. Well, what's the pushback on this? What's the evidence for the claim? You don't find anywhere in the New Testament this mention, especially in the Gospels. You don't find it mentioned in the earliest documents of the New Testament. You don't find any mention of it in the first thousand years of church history. The earliest claim for such, interestingly, is in the 19th century. Moreover, you don't find any evidence of such influence on his teachings as they aren't presented in any of the Gospels or any of the other documents of the New Testament, or in any subsequent documents written following the New Testament period. The question is, is there anything in Luke's gospel that precludes Jesus from having traveled to Egypt as a child under the conditions that Matthew describes? And the answer is a resounding no. Again, got to give Alex credit here. He pushes back. I get what you're saying, in other words. I get what you're saying, that it's it seems weird that Luke just wouldn't mention this, and it seems to allow for essentially you to splice in anything you like there. But bear in mind that it's the Gospel of Matthew that people are saying is splicing in oh, this what? story, not not some random theory about know. You know, well, Jesus the, going to in India. In other words, they have a theological motivation for it. Yeah. Now, what's interesting here is that Ehrman is willing to accuse others of having a theological motivation without recognizing his own theological motivations. Fundamentally, what needs to be pointed out to resolve this alleged contradiction is that Matthew seems to compress at least two years into his infancy narrative, whereas Luke focuses only on a few weeks or even a few months. Which brings us to another alleged contradiction, or more precisely, an error that's alleged that needs to be dealt. One historical contradiction of sorts that I find really fascinating is fascinating to me because it isn't a contradiction between Gospels, but rather a historical problem within one of the Gospels itself. And that is, uh, we've already mentioned this census, we, we mentioned it very briefly, but the the story as to why Jesus needs to travel, uh, why Joseph and Mary have to travel up to Bethlehem for the birth of Jesus, is because of this census where Joseph, for some reason, has to go back to place of his lineage and, and so he has to travel all the way up here. And this is said to happen, and it seems strange to me why this detail is even given. It seems it's said that this happens while Quirinius is the governor of Syria. Yeah. Why, why is that specified and, and why is that a problem? So the issue here is with Luke 2, 1 and 2. And Ehrman explains something important that we need to understand about the reference here. Well, it's specified because Luke, um, Luke especially, I'd say more than the other Gospels, wants to situate the things that happen in a real historical moment. And, you know, they don't have, they don't, 
date things the way we do. So you can't say, you know, yeah, this was in the year, you know, 5 BCE. You know, they don't have calendars like that. And so they date things by who was ruling when. This is very common in the Roman world. You say, you know, this happened when so-and-so was the consul, you know, for the second time. It's how they date things. Just want to add that this isn't something that was just done in the Roman era, but it was done broadly across the ancient world. And that's just a technical point. What's important here is what Ehrman says later. But the problem is that Quirinius became the governor of Syria uh, 10 years after Herod the Great had died. And Luke is also specific that this happened during the reign of Herod the Great. The problem with Ehrman's statement here that Herod died 10 years before Quirinius became the governor of Syria, and it's something that a self-proclaimed historian that he should simply be knowledgeable of. Ehrman is simply restating what is known as the Schurer Consensus, which comes from the work of a German historian by the name of Emil Schurer in 1896. And it's not consensus in the sense that Schurer was reporting a consensus of scholarship. Rather, it's that there are a substantial number of historians who simply agree with his conclusions, usually on ideological or theological grounds, kind of like Mark and Priority. The problem with the Schurer consensus is that there were historians both before and after who disagreed with its conclusions because he placed so much emphasis and depended so heavily on the work of the Jewish historian Josephus. Historians have noted that it's sometimes difficult to determine how exactly Josephus is calculating his dates for events as they often seem to conflict and he either dates events prior to or after other significant events in contradiction to contemporary historians of the period. Furthermore, dependence on Josephus is made questionable by contradictions within Josephus himself, especially when one attempts to correlate his own varying chronologies. The best available data suggests that Herod died sometime in the first quarter of 1 BC. The best summary of this discussion can be found in the work of Andrew Steinman, whose paper I'll link below. Ehrman contends that Luke is simply wrong, but such a contention, when considered in the light of the totality of the historical data, Ehrman contends that Luke is simply wrong, but such a contention, when considered in the totality of the data, both historical and linguistic, is itself problematic, as the objections and accusations are based largely in our English translations, which often struggle with the nuances of the original language, as well as the complexity of the history as Wayne Brindle discusses in his paper on the subject, which will also be linked below. Now, most commentators on this passage in the last 60 years have noted that Luke's language should be taken to imply that he's referring to a census that occurred prior to the census of Quirinius, with a reluctance to formally stick the landing due to a lack of actual physical evidence. And I discussed such in this post here. But it suffices to say that Ehrman, who is often so bold in his proclamations, is simply wrong himself. And here's why the accusation of contradiction fails. First, he fails to recognize that Matthew and Luke operate on entirely different time scales, with Matthew appearing to operate on a scale of years, where Luke operates on a scale of months. This distinction of time scales makes any accusation of contradiction fall apart when one necessarily takes into account the period of time that must be reconciled. Now, Alex correctly pointed out that appeals to silence on a particular issue doesn't equal a contradiction. Moreover, when coupled with the recognition that there are differing time scales that one needs to be considered, then the issue of silence becomes even more pronounced and more obvious and more subject to the need for reconciliation. Lastly, and most importantly, we need to recognize that Ehrman is arguing from a seriously biased and out-of-date scholarship due to his adoption of the over 100-year-old Schur consensus and a failure to interact with the most up-to-date and relevant historical and grammatical scholarship on the subject. Ehrman loves to tout his credentials as a scholar, but he regularly makes arguments that are easily refuted by a simple search of the relevant scholarship, which has led me to ask this question in the past. Is Ehrman ignorant, or is he intentionally dishonest? And it's a question that I tackle in this post here. Well, that's all for this episode of the blogcast. Again, I'm Triggerman1976. 
you can follow me on X and Instagram at Triggerman1976. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up by hitting that like button. If you found it interesting, please share it with your friends. And if you don't mind, hit that subscribe button. Until next time, I'm Triggerman1976, and I'll be seeing you. And above all, thanks for watching.